Whatever happened to Jim Sharp? Hi, I'm Doug Thompson, co-host of this week's show, Hey, Whatever Happened to Jim Sharp? Each week we take you up close and personal with a celebrity either born in Kansas or with a strong connection to Kansas. While Jim Sharp may not be as well known as some of the celebrities we cover on the show, he has lived a very exciting life. Jim was born in Morris County on April the 25th, 1924. As a teenage boy, he lived on the family farm in Morris County with his parents and four siblings. It became Jim's responsibility to ride his pony to the mailbox three quarters of a mile away to pick up the mail. Included in that mail was the Topeka Daily Capital. In the 1930s and 40s, Hitler's Germany was raging across Europe, acquiring more land and invading or occupying dozens of neighboring countries. As a young boy, Jim was mesmerized by Hitler's speaking ability, his SS troops, and his Panzer Blitzkrieg tactics. The Topeka Daily Capital was full of interesting information about how Hitler had brought Germany back from chaos following its defeat in World War I to be the leading nation on the European continent. Hitler put millions of unemployed back to work, building highways, schools, libraries, and established conservation and other work programs. He established the Hitler Youth and put the youth to work on useful activities which they compared to our Boy Scouts. Each time Adolf Hitler appeared in public, thousands of Germans would be there to greet him. The stadiums would be full and the streets lined with enthusiastic crowds amid waving Nazi flags. Hitler gained support among the masses with his superb speaking ability, promoting German blood, culture, and honor, and degrading the Jews and the communists. It took a few years for the countries of the world to realize that Hitler meant what he said and that his goal was to establish a new order of Nazi Germany in continental Europe. Hitler was appointed chancellor in 1933 and transformed the Republic into the Third Reich, a single party dictatorship. By 1941, Hitler was well on his way to accomplishing his goals as his army had invaded or occupied 95% of Europe, most of North Africa, and was positioned at the English Channel to invade England. Hitler now controlled an area that was roughly the equivalent of the landmass controlled by the Holy Roman Empire. Hitler and his chain of command organized the people of these countries to support Germany's war effort with slave labor from his factories and military conscription for the German army. He would exterminate the Jewish people, extinguish the national life of the Polish and Soviet Russians. France was reduced to a vassal and incorporated into the Third Reich. By 1941, Germany had invaded Russia. Meanwhile, in Morris County, farm boy Jim Sharp was reading about the German war machine and its powerful Luftwaffe Air Force under the command of Hitler's hand-chosen successor, Hermann Goering. Jim was also listening to reports of the war from wounded former classmates and friends. Almost weekly, Jim heard reports of young men from the Morris County area either being captured or killed in combat. Some of my buddies who had previously entered the service were getting killed and captured and wounded and their folks nearby, neighbors, were receiving notices of that and it kind of got to me and I decided I need to go and be a part of it. Jim remembers hearing the radio broadcast on December 7, 1941, that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. America was now at war. I think we just had dinner Sunday, and the news bulletin come on the radio 
that the Japs were bombing Pearl Harbor. And everybody was surprised uh, and didn't really know what the consequences were going to be. But we were, you know, like all Americans, we were prepared to do our duty and do anything possible that was necessary to help our country. And little did I realize how that would impact me the rest of my life. By 1944, at the age of 19, Jim made the decision to enter the Army, although he had a draft deferment. He took combat infantry training at Fort McClellan, Alabama. I volunteered for the paratroops, and I had went to Fort Bend in Georgia, flunked my physical because of broken arch or bad arch in my foot. Had a 10-day delay in route. This was December 44. 10-day delay in route, went home for 10 days and then ended up in Boston Harbor on a troop ship. We went up the gangplank and when I went up the gangplank, uh, uh, the Red Cross ladies handed each one of us a little ditty bag. In that ditty bag was candy, gum, a pencil, and that notebook right there, which I, once I got into the ship, uh, I started writing a diary about where I'd been the last month or two, and it ended up a diary through the rest of the war. Jim was a replacement during the Battle of the Bulge for Company B, 18th Infantry Regiment, 1st Infantry Division. We landed at Le Havre, France, and uh, we were getting on 40 and 8 boxcars, and the, the French engineer who was running the train said, where are you fellas going? And I said, we're going to the front lines. And his words that still stick with me were, you better get there in a hurry. The Germans have broken through and they're winning the war. Little did I realize that what he was talking about was the Battle of the Bulge. They penetrated our lines about 27, 28 miles on about a 30 mile front. So it was a pretty precarious situation before we got the lines uh, straightened out again. The Battle of the Bulge actually started December 16, 1944, and we actually got the lines straightened out to where they were originally in uh, January 26, 1945. Yeah. And of course, it was bitterly cold, but I was a farm boy. I knew how to take care of myself because I fed cattle and hogs and horses on the farm and out in the winter. I knew how to take care of myself pretty well, but it's tough to take care of yourself when you're down in a foxhole or out in the, in the weather. Foxhole is about the coldest place I've ever been in my life. You can't move, you can't get out, you get shot or artillery. So a lot of people had black feet, black ears, noses, fingers. But you had to be in terrible shape to get away from the front lines. Everybody wanted you would like to get behind the line instead of at the front. But you just couldn't get behind the lines because you were hurting. And when we went up to the front lines at night, we had to go up there at night. No light. You just, it, when it was in the Ardennes Forest, the battlefront extended into Belgium and, uh, Belgium and Luxembourg. And uh, the first thing we got to the front line, the, the platoon sergeant asked us if we understood any German. And of course, I did not understand any German. I just graduated from White City and hadn't had any language. But he said, well, there's several words you need to understand in German up here. And he said, those words are six words. Come see here, but handy hole. And he said, that means come here with your hands over your head. And make sure that when you say those words or shout them, that you're in cover, under cover. Because you'll either get shot at or you'll capture some, some prisoners. Jim earned three bronze stars and was wounded in combat in Uslar, Germany. Following the unconditional surrender of Germany, he helped arrest members of the Nazi leadership, including civilians, Gestapo, SS staff, and the highest level of the Nazi leadership. Jim was then chosen as one of the select guards for the Four Power International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg for the post-war trials. While on duty for the Nuremberg trials, Jim was face to face with the evil Nazi war machine and the people he had read about in the Topeka Daily Capital as a young farm boy in Morris County. Prisoners Schacht, Seiss Inquart, von Papen, Dönitz and the rest of the 20 are led by Hermann Goering. On trial for their lives, they seem less than supermen, especially Rudolf Hess, 
who at first tried to persuade Allied doctors that he is insane. After the war was over, uh, we learned that the Allies, the four powers, that is Russia, France, Great Britain, the United States, were going to have a trial of the Nazi leaders that caused this World War II. And my company commander said and told the company in one of the meetings that he was to recommend people for guard duty at Nuremberg, where they were going to have the trial. And I was an NCO, I was a staff sergeant, and he said first they were going to select staff sergeants, and later he come to me and said, I would like to recommend you. He said, I was interested in going home, but I didn't have enough points to go home. So he said, if you, if you will agree to stay three months, which is length of the trial, supposedly, I'm going to, I'm going to recommend you, and you're going to have to go through an interview process to be selected. Well, long story short, I went through the process. I was selected, and I was assigned as a sergeant of the guard at Nuremberg in September. Uh, let's see, six months after the war, September 1945. United States Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson opens the prosecution's case. The privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated so malignant and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. That four great nations flushed with victory and stung with injury stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. The first time I saw them, they were in the recreation ward out walking. And I thought, well, these were supposed to look like monsters. That's what I'd learned in, in basic training, that they were evil people. Yet here they were strolling around under the trees in this recreation area, and they looked like they could have been walking in the city park back home. We weren't supposed to talk to them. We weren't supposed to make friends with them or converse with them at all. But eventually those rules were broken because when we would accompany them to their lawyer or to the doctor or wherever they needed to go, sometimes they had to wait and they'd ask us questions because they could speak pretty good English and we could speak German, some. So we got, we got uh, the rules were eventually relaxed and we got to really visit it with him. Jim was able to obtain the autographs of nine of the Nazi leaders on trial. I obtained nine signatures from people like Hermann Goring, who was of course the Luftwaffe commander, and, and Joachim von Ribbentrop, and the two top generals of Germany was uh, General Keitel and Jodl. The Jodl is the one that signed surrender terms with Eisenhower. And so I had nine signatures, nine autographs, and that's what this little autograph book is right here. The and signature in there, and it's also in the book Sergeant of the Guard at Nuremberg. I decided after the Diary of a Combat Infantryman, well, the Black Settlers was the first book, Black Settlers on the Call Indian Reservation, and that was pretty successful. And then uh, I started talking about all of this, and people thought, I wanted to know if I'd written a book about it, and my kids started asking about the diary. So I finally ended up and wrote the Black Settlers in 08, the diary of a combat infantry in 2010, and the sergeant of the guard in this year. Okay. Would you tell us what you have displayed in this case? Yes. Uh, these are artifacts of war. Uh, this is a, 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 a luminous dial watch, the first one I'd ever seen. Upper left-hand corner? Yes. I captured, I took that off a captured German officer. They were issued luminous dial watches so they could see at night. I'd never seen a luminous dial. This is upper a, center? Yes, that's a SS ring that come off a German soldier. This is the diary of a, that I wrote 
I got that when I went up to Gangplank from Red Cross ladies, which I mentioned. Mm -hmm. This is a German Army issue, a uh, nine millimeter pistol. About the size of your hand. Yeah. And then to the right there on the That's center. a German compass uh, that uh, NCOs have. And uh, here's the here's the uh, autograph book that we dug out of the rubble at uh, Nuremberg. The city was virtually destroyed, but this department store was opening up and and we're digging out the the produce that was uh, the products that were in the building and could be salvaged. And uh, let's see, this is a Panzer Corps uh, tank uh, emblem. Metal and then German flight badge. Yes. Yeah. Well, you had quite an interesting experience for a farm kid from White City that wound up uh, at the Nuremberg trials and getting to see many of those people who you had uh, uh, only heard about through the pages of history. And Jim, we thank you so much for being with us on uh, Hey, Whatever Happened To, and this edition is Jim Sharp. Appreciate it, my friend. Thank, thank you. you. Congratulations thank you. on going from private to E6 in two yeah. years. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> On October 15, 1946, Hermann Goering committed suicide by swallowing a cyanide pill. The baffling mystery of Hermann Goering's death, for 60 years after Hermann Goering was sentenced to be hanged at Nuremberg, the question of how he obtained cyanide to commit suicide remained a mystery. It was one of the most baffling mysteries of World War II. Luftwaffe Commander Hermann Wilhelm Goering was scheduled to be the first defendant to walk from his cell to the gym and the gallows. He would walk the short walk to the gallows accompanied by two guards. It was only 13 steps to the top and to the rope. Following the death sentence of death by hanging, Hermann Goering sent a short note to the Allied Control Council. It said, I would have no objection to being shot. However, I will not facilitate the execution of Jim Germany's Reich Marshal by hanging. For the sake of Germany, I cannot permit this. Moreover, I feel no moral obligation to submit to my enemy's punishment. For this reason, I have chosen to die like the great Hannibal. Hannibal was generally considered one of the greatest military commanders of all time. He lived and fought during the Holy Roman Empire's great conquest. Hermann Goering's request was denied. The hand-chosen successor of Adolf Hitler was to be the first to die in the gallows at 11 o'clock p.m. At 10.45 p.m., the security guard at the cell door of Hermann Goering noticed him making choking sounds. He alerted the sergeant of the guard and the officer of the day. The prison doctor was summoned, but it was too late. Hermann Goering had taken his own life and did not die by hanging. The real answer, according to Jim Sharp, was told to him by Herbert Lee Stivers of Hesperia, California in 2005. Herbert Lee was a guard at Nuremberg and was known by Jim Sharp. He was known to be a good soldier who would follow orders and could be relied upon to handle his duties and responsibilities. Herbert Lee stated that he had a German Fraulein friend who had friends, who were friends of Reich Marshal Hermann Goering. The Fraulein introduced Herbert Lee to her friends. They told Herbert Lee that Hermann Goering was a very sick man and not being provided the necessary medicine by his American doctors. Twice before Herbert Lee Stivers carried notes to Hermann Goering in a fountain pen, but the third time, instead of a note, they put medicine in the pen. Mr. Stiver secretly carried the medicine and gave it to Hermann Goering. He returned the pen to Fraulein in case more medicine was needed. In his suicide note, Goering bragged that he had had the cyanide capsule all along. Hermann Goering did so to protect the American soldier, the Fraulein, and her friends. This is not the official version of the Army, but because a 19-year-old farm boy from Morris County wanted to go help his friends during World War II, you now know the rest of the story. On October 16, 1946, 10 of the 11 war criminals were hanged in the small gymnasium in Nuremberg. Following his discharge, Jim enrolled at Kansas State and graduated in 1950 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration. He retired from Kansas Farm Bureau as manager of the information systems and became an independent business systems consultant. He also taught information classes at Kansas State and at Fort Riley. Jim is the author of other books, including Diary of a Combat Infantryman and Black Settlers of the Call Indian Reservation. In 2011, Jim returned to the courthouse gate in Nuremberg some 66 years later. The young farm boy who graduated from high school in White City, Kansas, has had quite a life, and now you know 
hey, whatever happened to Jim Sharp? For co-host Roger Thompson, I'm Doug Thompson. Thanks for watching. For more interview with Jim Sharp, go to our website at heywhateverhappenedto.org. Bye, everybody.